Hello, hello, hello. What's up, everyone? Let me just check and make sure all my devices are working properly. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Let me check the sound. Let me know in the chat if the sound is working properly. Uh, camera looks okay. Audio looks like it's testing okay here. Testing, testing. Okay. In the chat, can you hear me? Okay, here we go. I've got all the green lights from everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. I got on the Forbidden Crown by made by Copper Child, Copper Child Mike L. That's who makes the crowns. And we have a new custom crown coming very soon for Forbidden All's exclusive as well. Looking forward to that. So yesterday, uh, well, last week, and not yesterday, <laughs> last week I was on and I, I was live and I was talking about evidence uh, of the Anunnaki on Earth and um, went pretty deep into some of the circumstantial evidence. And the fundamental basis of that talk was to be able to explain or show that the Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid, and its surrounding temples in that region and area were put there for a specific reason and purpose, and not just put there because people decide they want to build something big, but it, it was truly encoded with wisdom and knowledge of the stars and our planet, incorporated, incorporated into the stone structures. I presented evidence to you last week on this YouTube channel and on Forbidden Knowledge TV that the Great Pyramid itself is a giant multifunctional stone computer that had the capability of uh, calculating various measurements and orbits, as well as uh, incorporated in it was a power generation system that would carry and create and generate power and transmit it through the apex to the surrounding obelisk, the, the granite uh, magnet, magnetized granite obelisk that were around the region, and that the jet pillar would capture lighting and uh, lighting that they would need to paint the inside of these tombs and so forth. If you go to Egypt uh, with me in 2022, you'll go into the Valley of the Kings, okay? And in the Valley of the Kings, we go deep into these tombs underground, and you'll see that these tombs don't have any soot on the ceilings uh, of these incredible reliefs, all this paint, all this artwork, all the colors are vibrant, right? But if you take a torch deep down in the ground with you, there's two things that are going to happen. The first thing is the, the flames, the fire, is going to suck up the oxygen because obviously we know that fire eats oxygen. The second thing that's going to happen is uh, you're going to create soot from the carbon, from the flames burning. That carbon is going to rise to the ceiling inside the tomb, and it's going to make layers of carbon, which we call soot. That's going to damage all the elaborate work that you're doing. So why in the world would you take all the time and energy to do this elaborate work, right? Elaborate painting and everything else, and then have flames damage it. They were too smart. They actually used light bulbs. And the Egyptians document these light bulbs at the Temple of Dendera. So if you come to the Temple of Dendera with me in October of 2022, and the link will be in the caption of this uh, video for, to register for that trip, we're going to go into this underground crypt. It's a very small space to get down into the crypt. Then you can actually stand up. But it's really, really tight going down there and getting into this crypt. On the way out, as a matter of fact, I banged my head pretty hard. I misjudged the... The, the width of the granite block that covers it, it's about this wide. And so when I came up, I came up a little bit too early and I got a um, I got one of those cartoon knots on top of my head. But when we go down there, you're going to see the most amazing relief that you've ever seen. You're going to see Egyptians holding a piece of technology called a jet pillar that looks like a Tesla coil. And you're going to see this power cable coming out of it that's connected to a light bulb. And that light bulb is what they use to light up these underground crypts to do the artwork and the relief painting and everything else. OK, it's going to be amazing. I'm telling you, this trip is going to be mind blowing. October 2022. You don't want to miss it. The link will be in this uh, the caption of this podcast or this video or Forbidden Knowledge TV video as well. 
or go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on the uh, Forbidden Tour of Egypt and register for that ASAP. Okay, so we're going to kind of take off now from where I left off last week and I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Let me share my screen here. Um, let's see here. This thing says slides. This is interesting. It says something new. Oh, I have no slide. Oh, you can preload slides in this thing now. That's pretty cool. Uh, let me go to my share screen. I'll have to play with that next time. I don't want to play with it right now. And let me get into the windows and go to the PowerPoint. Okay. And we will try to get into where we were the last time. Okay. Now, let me take this full screen. Let's see here. Slideshow. All right. Now, since I can't see my face anymore on the screen, I'm going to double check this on my phone just to make sure you guys can still see everything. Because last week we had a little glitch when I did this on I disappeared. Phone, just to make sure you guys can still see. So let me know. I'm looking at the chat right now from my phone. Let me know if you can see the full screen and you can see me at the same time. It looks like I can. It looks legit. Looks good. Okay, cool. Great. Now I see a couple of questions in the chat. Now that I got my phone up on side of me here, a couple of people are asking, do you have to get the, the jab to go to Egypt? No, you don't. As a matter of fact, you don't have to get the jab to go to any country. Now, some countries will tell you like the UK, if you go into the UK, they'll tell you that if you don't have it, you'll have to do a, a you'll have to self quarantine for a week before you can go out anywhere. Um, other than that, all countries, I think Australia as well, all countries have the same policy. And when I say all, I'm talking about every single one, with the exception of maybe four or five tiny ones way up there at the top of the world. Um, all you have to have is a PCR test, a negative PCR test to go into the country and a negative PCR test to leave the country. I've been traveling around the world nonstop since this whole thing started and nothing has stopped me. Nobody cares about it. Nobody wants it. So it's a good thing. So travel while it's still legal. It's not required at this moment, at this particular moment in time, it's not required. And Egypt is extremely liberal when it comes to this. You don't even have to wear masks out there. They don't really care. You can. It's up to you whether you want to wear it or not. It's very laid back, very, very refreshing to be able to go there and just relax and do you know what, we, what I went there to do, which was to explore. I mean, there's a couple of places that you have to put one on, which is the brand new museum. There's a couple of them being built. One is open, one is not. And there was one where they have the the crocodile, uh, kind of the mini crocodile museum, that one. Other than that, I didn't have to put anything on anywhere. Matter of fact, I took it off in the airport. So it's pretty, pretty laid back, pretty cool. And there's no jab required, okay? Because I'm not going anywhere where there's a jab required. And so far, there's none. I've been checking. Somebody told me Turkey. No, wrong. You can go to Turkey. You don't need to have the jab. You can go to Turkey. All you have to have is a PCR test to get in the country and a PCR test to get out of the country. Now, what you're looking at here on the screen is Cydonia. I'm kind of overlapping just to end a couple of the end slides where I left off last week. This is Cydonia on Mars. You can see the DNM pyramid, which is a five sided pyramid. You can see the face on Mars. You can see the Pleiadian star system above up to the left a little bit here at the very top, almost towards the middle. And then you can see going down to the back hind of this this terraformed uh, land here in Cydonia on Mars, you can see Orion's belt right here. And you can see that they terraformed this entire area, which is literally hundreds of miles. They terraformed it to look like a lion's, a lioness or a lion, right? I can't tell if it's a lioness or a lion because I can't tell if it's a mane or not a mane, but it definitely looks more like a feline type of a, a structure, the way that they've etched or carved these rocks and these stones. This is somebody with high technological advancement. And to add credibility to what I'm talking about, if you go to Avebury in the UK, somebody, a researcher made an amazing um, alignment about maybe, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago. He was looking at Avebury and there's mounds in Avebury. There are these artificial structures that are built up mounds, move, well, people move millions of tons of earth to make these, these structures in this particular format. And this is the actual ordnance map. He started to realize when he was studying the images that came back from Cydonia 
from Mars that they were very, very similar. So he laid them on top of each other. And when he did that, he found that the Avebury in the UK and the structures on Mars, the anomalies on Mars, they perfectly line up. They align perfectly when you overlay the, the ordnance map and Cydonia down to the millimeter. It's, 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 you, it's, it can't be a coincidence. And his hypothesis is the same as mine. Whoever built these mounds had knowledge, had foreknowledge of these structures on Mars at Cydonia. And Cydonia is the ancient term for Cairo, the ancient name for Cairo. Okay. So that's kind of where we left off. And this is Dear Allah, Jordan. All right. Dear Allah, which I'm going to be going to Jordan in 2023 because I'm going to go to uh, check out some of the, there's some structures there that are built into the side of a mountain, very similar to Abu Simbel, which we'll be going to on our Egypt tour, where King Ramses built, built Abu Simbel. And he built the other temple on the side for his wife, Nefertari. Both of these, um, these, these temples were carved into the side of a mountainside. Okay. And the same thing you can find at Jordan. So I'm going to be going to Jordan to document that because it used the same exact technology. And what's interesting about these, um, these temples is when you're cutting into the side of a mountain, you literally have to start your cut because you're making this temple out of one piece of rock. Your cut has to be so precise. The very first cut has to be so precise. It can't be off by a couple of centimeters. Otherwise, the entire temple is off of alignment and you can't create the elaborate rooms. You can't create the elaborate reliefs and everything else, because by the time you got in, you got to remember that those few centimeters, they magnify into feet and those feet magnify into yards and so forth and so on. And so by the time you got deep into the structure, your alignments are all the way off and you can't complete a sound structure. So we know that these people had some type of laser guided technology or something very similar to laser guided technology to build those things. Now, this face here on Earth is a, an exact copy of the one that was discovered on Mars on the right. OK, and um, this is the um, the temple of Alalu. If you read the Sumerian tablets, you discover that Alalu, uh, he basically got into a battle with Anu. Anu was the the father of the pantheon that first arrived here. And he wanted to challenge him for kingship over Earth. Uh, and, and even and even Nibiru, the home planet, or in some in later texts called Marduk. And so they had this ritual where if you want the challenge and if the king accepted the challenge, you would battle. You would battle naked. And so Alalu battled Anu, and Anu defeated him, and Alalu was down on his knees. And in his defeat, he jumped up with his mouth and he bit off the private parts of Anu and swallowed it. And so he was sentenced to death, rightfully so, <laughs> for doing that. And so this temple, this face was built on Mars as a temple, uh, and which is where he was um, sent to alive while he was still alive to die there. And there's a copy of it here in Dear Allah at Jordan on Earth. So we're talking about the Pleiadian star system a lot. You've heard me mention it quite a bit. It's mentioned in a lot of ancient texts. It's mentioned, it's shown on a lot of artifacts. I have about 30 artifacts that I've collected over the years. Some are replicas, uh, you know, made from casts. Some are originals. What's interesting about these artifacts is they all depict the Pleiadian star system. The Pleiadian star system is, is depicted on artifacts that predate the Bible predate um you know our our technology to even see them uh and explore them you know through telescopes we can see them from the naked eye but what's interesting is from the naked eye it only looks like seven stars but through telescopes we have to discover obviously that there's literally thousands of stars in that one you know spot in the sky but the most brightest ones we call the seven sisters even though visibly there's only really six because one actually ran out of fuel which the um the pre-dynastic peoples of Kem, of the Kemetic people, documented that one of the stars had run out of fuel, and that got then taught to the Greeks, and then the Greeks also passed it into their history as well. So they still named the seventh star, even though the seventh star had basically died. Pretty interesting stuff. A lot of knowledge of stuff that we can't see with the naked eye. I mean, you can't see a star when it dies. You don't know that a white dwarf is there, just like Sirius A, B, and C, where the Dogon come from. Where the Dogon, the Nomo come from that visited the Dogon, I should say. The Nomo came from Sirius. Uh, but 
one of the stars that they came from, they claimed it had come from, uh, it ran out of fuel. It turned into a white dwarf, and you can't see it with the naked eye because it's too close to Sirius A. Uh, we couldn't see it, you know, up until what we call mo the modern era with sophisticated telescopes. But the Dogon have been carrying this information for thousands of years. They know the orbital period of the trinary star system in the Sirius star, uh, star system. They know the alignments with those stars and our star. And they were taught the shape, size, and, and color of every planet in our solar system, the Dogons. And they still carry that wisdom till this very day. Now, what you see here is an image, you know, a sci-fi image, what looks like a sci-fi image here of a galactic war going on, space war. And the reason why I'm showing this is because when you dig into these ancient texts from various different um, uh, time periods, various different civilizations, they all reference the Pleiades and they all seem to reference this ancient war that happened in space. You can go into the Enomia Lish, you can go into the Atrahasis, you can go into the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, you can go into the Terra Papers. Um, there's so many documents you can go into the Tibetan uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, there's so many documents out there that, that that allude to the fact that there was this war that occurred. And now what we have to do is all I can take from, from the accounts and some of the verbal handed down histories, like from the Aboriginal people talking that they were brought here by Pleiadians. They said that they were seated on this planet and along with other people much later that this planet that we live on is an abandoned seed colony. And so when you have a war and you have planets being destroyed, you have big chunks of planet going to crash into another planet. That creates another global catastrophe. So what we had was space refugees. No, it sounds crazy, but that's what we had. Now, these people, these quote unquote, we would call them aliens. We look like them and they look a lot like us as well. Now, there are some some differences, you know, in, in some of the look. But overall, they are hominid beings. This war was so bad that people fled that region of space because they had to. And they then took home breakaway civilizations on other planets, other star systems. Some crash landed on a planet named Nibiru that orbited a brown dwarf star. That brown dwarf star gravitationally was captured by our solar system and had it on this weird elliptical orbit for quite some time. During that whole process, it even had moons that collided into another planet that was in our solar system named Tiamat. Tiamat was collided into and then it actually blew up and became the asteroid belt. That's how we got the asteroid belt, which orbits our sun. Gigantic pieces of rock that are literally uh, a, a former planet. A giant piece of Tiamat broke away and swung into the position we are now, recoalesced with all the liquid water and organic material on it, and became the Earth. So the Earth is a result of a collision with Tiamat, and that's how we got the Earth. The moon does not come from Earth. The moon is not a result of a collision with Earth. Our moon was gravitationally tugged away from the Tiamat explosion because it used to be a or it used to be a habitable orbit moon that orbited Tiamat as well as Mars. Mars was a habitable moon that orbited Tiamat as well. Once Tiamat blew up, the side that was facing Mars, became, Mar it, was, it became charred. Mars has one side that's completely charred and the other side is smooth. And that's because that's the side where the debris hit. And then Mars has evidence of a pole shift of the crust. So we see that the weight from all that debris hitting Mars shift the crust and put the axis, the, the equator, I'm sorry, on a different axis. And this is all geology. This is basic science geology. This is not even, this is peer-reviewed, well-known science. It's not even a mystery. It, it can be seen. It can be documented. It, it's, it's actually been reviewed that Mars has a shift of the pole and a shift of the equator by about 45 degrees. What can cause that? Whatever hit that side that charted and burned it, shifted it like this, giving Mars a global disaster, which is why when we look at a lot of the anomalies up there, they look destroyed and there's debris everywhere okay <clears throat> now where did they go we have some people that fled out to sirius orion aldebron hades and the pleiades of course is where a lot of them started out so they spread out throughout the the, the different regions some like i said landed on the uh, planet in the enumi Elish named nibiru in the ancient text of nibiru uh, ancient text of the enumi Elish. In a, in a newer copy about 5,000 years ago, Marduk changed Nibiru to his name, Marduk, 
right? Or Marduk, depending on how you want to pronounce it. <clears throat> that planet that they landed on uh, captured, got captured by our sun and went into this very strange elliptical orbit. And that's this orbit that you see here, where it goes way out far into the deep reaches of our uh, our solar system, far beyond Pluto, but still in the inner Oort cloud region. And then it swings around the sun every, according to the um, Sumerians, every Shar, which was about 3,600 years. Now that orbit has slightly changed over time. And now modern astrophysicists say that it's about 4,200 years because they discovered this. It's not even a mystery. It's actually in the history books now. They call it Planet Nine. The migration. The first worlds of the Lyrans colonized were in Vega. Okay. Later on, the surviving races of the Lyran explorers would also move to Sirius and on to Orion, Aldebaran, Zeta Reticulus, Nibiru, while others already came to Earth and from Earth moved to the Pleiades after it cleaned up, after, after the debris was you know cleared out. So we had Pleiadians that visited Earth long before the Anunnaki uh, from Nibiru. They're all Anunnaki because Anunnaki means people who came from heaven to Earth. It doesn't mean one race. But long before the well-known documented one from Sumeria came here. Right. And so evidence of this can be found in Australia. So I went to Australia and I was looking for these proto-Egyptian hieroglyphs in Australia and these Pleiadian hieroglyphs. But we got we got we were taken to both. I can't say we found them because, of course, the elders already knew where they were located. So they took us out to both, which there's a whole documentary coming out on this called The Mystery of the Gosford Glyphs. I'm working on that now. OK, I've been working on it for a little while. I got slowed down a little bit because of the, um, you know, the whole si the situation that happened with the whole shutdown. But there's a lot of evidence around the planet for this war and also for a war that even extended from Earth to other moons and planets. For example, this is the Star Wars Mill Millennium Falcon. But if you go back and look in the archives, you'll find that they found one of these things on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. It's ironic that it looks virtually almost the same as the Millennium Falcon. And this has been researched now for about eight years. They've sent deep subs down to it now to analyze it, take pieces of it away. And the conclusion is that it's not of this world. And there's a giant skid mark even leading up to it. This down here at the bottom is actually a video clip where they're talking about it. So this is one of those UFOs that hit the ocean after being um, damaged in some way, shape, or form. Skidded on the bottom, left about a mile-long skid mark, and came to a stop in that location. And it's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. It's well documented. There's a documentary that I'm in, which we have quantum physicists, marine biologists, and everybody else involved in researching this thing. Look it up. The Baltic Sea Anomaly. Look that look up that documentary on Forbidden Knowledge TV. It's on there. Okay. So the Lyran Wars. Now, let me go back for a second. Vega. Let me go back here real quick. You see here where it says the first migration of the worlds were colonized in Vega. In Vega, now the Lyrans, Assyrians, and the Vegans were all different races of hominid, just like you have different races of people on Earth. The Vegans were black people, okay, just like me right here. Now, of course, the heads were a little bit different. The heads were a little bit bigger, but they were black people. The Lyrians were um, uh, the Lyrians were people that actually had a, a face that kind of looked a little feline-ish in a weird kind of way. Okay, uh, and the Syrians, you, you, you know, the Syrians, the people from uh, yeah, the Syrians, they they looked more Caucasian. So there was a mix. Um, and what's interesting is you see these same races primarily on Earth. You see, the thing about the people on Earth is we keep looking for aliens, and we are the aliens. That's the, that's the problem. We ourselves are actually the aliens that we've been looking for. There's no little green men running around. It's actually us. So they had a lot of battles. The battles were over the same thing we're battling over here, consciousness between the Christ and the Antichrist. See, this stuff goes way back long before the biblical times, long before the Bible was written. 
the Christ is a level of consciousness and people who are for the light and against the light is basically what it is. It's a certain way of thinking. Um, and so there, there, this big war ensued over consciousness, over who can rule and run and control things from a position of dominance or who can live and and con con not control, but but enjoy and explore and be in synchronicity with with the nature and the universal consciousness. And, you know, so the same battle we're having here on Earth right now in, in this exact current time, it's the same exact battle that literally hasn't changed. We're still battling for the same exact thing. If you look at the situation where you have people that just want to live in synchronicity and harmony and live a green life, right, in synchronicity with the Earth, and and find new ways to prosper outside of this current monetary matrix and then you have the people that don't want that to happen and at this particular moment in time they have a little bit more power over the other just because of knowledge and understanding how to manipulate fear because once you manipulate fear you get control so they've learned how to pull the fear the, 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 the fear strings on the people and they're they're puppeteering the people of the earth through fear and so it's, you know, it's this fear porn is what it is. And it's the same exact thing that happened in ancient times, except we haven't gotten to the point where we've annihilated each other, thankfully. Okay. The main original Lyra and Elohim humanoid races were committed to the law of one and of service to others and the Christic ideology. And the Lyra and Elohim were supervising the Syrians to host the seeding of the 12 strand DNA genetics on the 5D planet Tara. These groups involved were involved in seeding the DNA and rehabilitation, and they're called the Lyran Syrian High Councils. Okay. Now, if you go to Egypt and you say, well, you know, where are these, these people with the cat faces? You know, how come they didn't come to earth? Well, you see Sekhmet is one of the oldest known Egyptian deities, and her name is derived from the Egyptian word Sekhem, which means power or might, and is often translated as the powerful one. She who was powerful. She's depicted as a lion-headed woman and sometimes with the addition of a sun disc on her head. And that sun disc is not our sun. It's the sun of another in another location, another star system, by the way. Her seated statue saw her holding the Ankh of Life. But when she is shown striding or standing, she usually holds a scepter formed from papyrus. Uh, this is, you know, pretty amazing stuff. And so we have this depiction of a woman. That's well documented. And according to the ancient Egyptians and according to some of the the uh, the the homegrown Egyptian guides, this entity had the face of a lioness or a lion like face. And she was always depicted this way because according to them, this is how she looked. It's not according to me, Billy Carson. It's according to them and the ancestors. You also had these other races here called the Ubaid people. The Ubaid people predated the arrival of the well-known documented Anunnaki named Anu, Anki, uh, and Lil, Thoth, and those guys. These people were here before they got here. These people originated in the Pleiades, made their way to Earth long before anyone else. And they were here, uh, according to the aboriginals, they were seated on this planet by these people. And you can look at them, you see that their faces are not human faces. They look more um, reptilian or reptoid type fa bodies and faces. They found hundreds of these statuettes um, located in Iraq. They found some of the structures that they used to live in. They had a monarchical type of society where they um, you had kings and you had queens. Uh, that's st that same structure, that similar type of a structure. You see here the one on the far right. There's a woman there uh, holding a baby. The one on the bottom left, the woman is breastfeeding a baby, and the baby itself also looks not really human, but humanoid. They had um, a cat system where you can see that some people were had higher levels, depending on the statuette you were looking at. Some you can see that the clothing and, uh, uh, and the, um, the sphere or the staff and the, the, the robing made them appear to be more royal. And then you had people that were walking around naked. So those are the poor people, okay, or the people that had a lower class. So they had this class system kind of similar to what they had actually in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, it wasn't exactly as everybody thought it was. Okay, you gotta study this stuff. You gotta you gotta go there, you gotta you gotta learn. 
you had a king and a queen, right? And then you had the servants of them. You had the politic level, politician level. You had the working class people. You had the extremely poor people. If you were extremely poor, you walked around naked. That way you weren't caught stealing anything from the king. Okay. This is how they did you. You walked around butt naked. That's how people knew you were poor. You put any clothes on, then you'd just be killed. Okay. This is a fact. This is real information. So it's not exactly mm, like you thought it was, but um, it's pretty interesting the way they had this thing set up. <clears throat> a variety of mystery religions existed in the ancient world, such as the mysteries of Demeter and Eleusis, of Mithras and Orpheus. That's where they get Morpheus. And the initiates underwent a number of secret rituals to join these cults, swearing oaths to keep the proceedings secret. And as a result, the substance of their beliefs and the nature of their ritual has been almost lost entirely. These peoples created a, a version of the mystery schools uh, and several different types as well to keep the secrets and the wisdom and the knowledge of where they came from and what they did and how uh, they ended up here a secret. And only adept initiates would be able to get access to this wisdom and this knowledge and to also the knowledge of some of the technology and the advanced spiritual practices as well. And for the at what they considered the average person, they weren't allowed in. They weren't allowed to learn any of this stuff. Unfortunately, over time, these mystery schools turned into secret societies and then they became twisted by the evil of man's consciousness and turned into uh, they, they decided to use the wisdom for darkness instead of light. And that's where you get the skull and crossbones and all these other things, um, Illuminati and all this other stuff. Those things all started originally as knowledge and wisdom mystery schools and then much later became twisted and turned to darkness. So I went to Carry On 9 in Australia, and it was a great trip. That was the beginning of 2020, right before everything closed. In fact, I landed as everything was shutting down. Okay, I just made it out. Otherwise, I would have been trapped there for a few months, probably, or maybe more. I don't know what would have happened. Um, but, you know, the Aboriginal people, there's some amazing, amazing people. And they, like I said before, they claim to have been seated on this planet. Uh, they, say, they say that the Pleiadians brought them here and then much later brought others to this planet as well. Ironically, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, North and South Americas, right? In America, they call them Native Americans, but that's actually not a good name to call them. That's actually an insult, believe it or not. I mean, you probably didn't know that, but it's an insult. The indigenous people of the Americas, uh, they call them Indians, but they're not Indians. They, um, they have the same story. You know, the Hopi and, and Lakota and everybody else, they have the same story. The same story is that they were seated on this planet by their star brothers. So it's ironic on two opposite sides of the world, we have two completely separate cultures, both indigenous. In other words, they're, you know, they're in their lands. They're living off the land. They're living in, in synchronicity with the land. And they're in tune with the earth and everything else. But they also have the same exact story that they were seated on this planet. Pretty interesting stuff. Not only that, they were both saved from calamities by these people. So the aboriginals have a story as when there was a global catastrophe in that region that they were saved by these, these beings. And also the, the Native American tribes, right, the indigenous peoples of the America, their, their histories, especially the Hopi, they've very, been very outspoken about it, is that um, they were saved by these beings. And these, some of them look like, they call them ant people. And there's a lot of uh, rock uh, cave reliefs where they draw themselves as being no, looking as normal people being led deep down into these caves and these underground structures to survive catastrophes and calamities by these ant beings that they call them ant people but they they just kind of look very strange obviously pretty interesting stories so there are seven major stars in the Pleiades cluster, cluster which are uh, Tigeta, Maya, Pleon, Atlas, Merope, Electra and Alcyone, uh, and the Pleiades are the are a very ancient race of humanoids uh, living in the Pleiades. I'm sorry, are a very ancient race of humanoids. And what's what's interesting about the Pleiades and these ancient races? A lot of the stuff that we see on Earth, a lot of the stuff that we see uh, in some of these ancient sites and these ancient temples, they were built. Yes, a lot of them by people we call humans. But the architectural floor plans were given to them by our cousins who were not from here. 
And so uh, it's pretty interesting because a lot of the the sites that, that mainstream says are only built four to 5,000 years ago or less, they're super ancient sites. For example, in Maya, in, in uh, Mesoamerica, former Mesoamerica, now we call it Mexico, right? In the Yucatan Peninsula, where the Mayans used to live in the Aztecs, they actually did not build any of the structures that are there. And the Mayans that live there will tell you this. You can go to these places. Mexico is wide open. You can go and you can get on a tour, get homegrown guides. They'll tell you the same thing. They actually teach this actually even, even in their schools over there. The Mayans arrived after Teotihuacan and the structures down into the Yucatan Peninsula at Chichen Itza were already built. A couple of hundred years later, the Aztecs had a huge volcanic eruption in where they lived and the, the, the eruption destroyed their valley. They had to migrate out. They became refugees. They stumbled into where? Teotihuacan. And they ended up taking it over and making it their home. However, they built nothing. This is why you see, um, you know, understanding that there's depictions of the Mayans. They would take out the heart of the beating heart of a person and sacrifice it to the gods. They would take virgins and throw them into wells so that they're hoping that the gods would make it rain. And so how can you have to say to yourself, how can a, a race of people be so um, barbaric, but yet be so technologically advanced to build these structures? This takes real foreknowledge, real forethinking, real mathematics, calculations, uh, and a knowledge of the stars beyond what the eye can see. And now these people are ripping people's hearts out while, they're, while the heart's still beating and eating it. So you find out, though, that, hey, this is something I had to learn this about maybe six years ago. The Mayans just inherited what was already there. The Mayans didn't build any of it. And what you'll find is that story, that story is like the same story everywhere you go almost. A lot of these places were just moved into. They were already there. They existed. The Great Pyramid at Giza, in my opinion, this is not in any documentation, but in my opinion, after reading the Emerald Tablets and both is talking about building the Great Pyramid 36,000, well, the tablets are 36,000 years. I believe that the, the pyramid was built about 56 to 60,000 years ago. My personal opinion, not anybody else. It's just mine. After analyzing the Sphinx, being in the Sphinx enclosure, touching the Sphinx with my own hands, looking at the weathering patterns and analyzing and researching the, uh, the precipitation and the flooding that occurred and also the burial of the Sphinx by the time over the, over the hundreds of years. I come to the conclusion as well, based on the alignment with the with the um, uh, constellation of Leo, which is supposed to be aligned with, that it wasn't aligned uh, 5,000 years ago, that it wasn't aligned 13,000 years ago, that it was an alignment 36,000 years ago, two, two processional periods back before we currently are right now. So if you take the procession of the equinoxes and analyze where the stars are in the sky and you watch it go across the sky as like a, a time clock, you go back two processional periods, you end up at 36,000 years, right around the perfect time to build the Great Sphinx. And I personally believe that the Great Sphinx was built around 36,000 years ago. And by the way, I see some super chat donations here, Solar God, and a few others. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, that's where I'm, you know, that's where I'm getting it. Now in, in Australia, here goes some Pleiadian hieroglyphs that are etched into a gigantic stone slab out there. This picture is taken from my own camera. And what's interesting is on the other side are the Egyptian glyphs, and on this side are the Pleiadian glyphs. These glyphs have never been fully deciphered. And we know the age of them because if you can see, I don't know if you can see from your screen, but there's a little green inside the cracks of these uh, hieroglyphs. And that is patina. And so you can date the patina. It grows very slowly, but it's organic material. And it's been dated back to about 5,000 years. So we know that these, we know that these hieroglyphs are 5,000 years old, okay, which is pretty interesting. So 5,000 years ago, according to the Aboriginals, the Pleiadian people used to come here and, and visit consistently. Uh, and then at one point, they just stopped. Okay, pretty interesting. On the other side, we have the um, the Egyptian, proto-Egyptian hieroglyphs, which now have been validated by the Board of Antiquities of Egypt and the Museum of Cairo. So we know that these are authentic proto-Egyptian 
hieroglyphs and we have the documents and the paperwork on it and everything which will be coming out in the documentary mystery of the gospel glyphs again these hieroglyphs were also dated because of the patina and we found that they were um 5, years old as well so 5,000 years ago and beyond we know that egyptians were coming to uh, coming to egypt and the reason why they came according to them they were coming to get wisdom from the aboriginal elders the visitation stopped only about 500 years ago. And the reason why the visitation stopped is because the Aboriginal people forbid them to ever come back. Because uh, 500 years ago, uh, some of them came over and two guys from the, uh, on the Egyptian side stole some sacred rocks from the Aboriginal elders. They have these amazing sacred rocks, these multi-layered stones that have these different metals on the inside of them. So it's crazy stuff. Well, they stole a couple of those stones, and after stealing those sacred rocks, the Egyptians were forbidden to ever return, or they would be whoop, killed. And so the the visitation stopped about five hundred years ago. Just amazing work you can see these hieroglyphs. And what drew me to this area was I heard a story by the Strong family uh, about the. The hieroglyphs here and, and they were analyzing them and, and deciphering them that two brothers came over from egypt and to come learn from the aboriginals right hang out over here for a minute and one brother got bit by a snake pretty quickly upon arrival didn't see it in the grass got bit by a snake and so and this area is out in deep bush matter of fact when i was out there i had on leather straps around my ankles high top shoes and long jeans to to protect my ankles in case something tr tried to jump up and bite me a snake but so the brother got bit the other brother tried to save him couldn't save him he ended up dying so the one brother uh mummified him right there and the stone that he used to create the mummification table is still sitting there and he mummified him and then he uh, wrapped him up took him back to egypt years later I, I saw the story of the brothers return to Egypt in the hieroglyphs from Australia. And I said, oh, man, I got to go to this place. And it became like a quest. I had to get there. I just no matter what, I had to get here. Finally, I got here and I almost didn't make it because the fires were going on. I don't know if you remember those fires. The fires were pretty bad. And um, I was like, man, but, you know, if I don't get it out there now, what if the fire destroys this area? So while we were out there, fires were all around us. There was another cave area that had some ancient writings in it, and we couldn't get to it because the fires had already destroyed it. So I'm glad we got out here to document this because the fires are so random out there. You never know when this is not going to be here ever again. So we got some great footage, 4K video, lots of photos, high mega pistol, high quality photos, and all that's going to be in the um, in the documentary. Let's see what this is here. It's a blank page. The Pleiades are also talked about in ancient Mesopotamia. That's this region over here. You see this where you have Canaan, Lebanon, Syria, the Euphrates River cuts through, Sippar, Babylon, all of that, that whole region. All they talked about consistently, all they depicted consistently in the, in the, in the artwork and the hieroglyphs and everything else was the Pleiades. Why? Because according to the Sumerians, this is the home base, the one of the first home bases of these pantheon of Anunnaki that came here, Ea Enki and Lil, then Hersag and all of them, they came here first to this region. And according to the Sumerians, these people hailed from different star systems, not from Earth. Not according to Billy Carson, according to the text that's left behind and baked into, into clay, okay, that turned now into stone. Not according to what I think in my head, according to the tablets. And a lot of the information that I'm talking about with regards to, to the Pleiadian star system and the, the fact of the, uh, the ancients looking to them and, and, and saying that, um, you know, we come from there, basically, which is our cousins, because we're now ju we're just a slightly genetically modified version of them. You can look at this resource list right here, Burnham Celestial Handbook, okay, revised and enlarged edition, Robert Burnham, star names. They are lower in meaning, Richard Hinckley, Star Lords of All Ages, William Tyre Ocklet, Star Tales, Ian Ridpath, The Age of Fable, Thomas Bullfinch, The Greek Myths, Robert Graves, 
The Reader's Encyclopedia, William Rose Bennett, American Heritage Dictionary, 1965, Fundamentals of Physics, David Halliday and Robert Resnick. All these books are my source material for a lot of the knowledge that I have with regards to the Pleiades. And of course, then you have to add the other ancient tablets and texts, which would be the Numa Elish, the Mahabharata, the Atra Hasis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, um, in those texts. Uh, it's just really an amazing thing to understand and learn about because um, we always want to know, like, where do we come from? Like, how do we get here? I don't believe that a single cell amoeba, right? A single cell organism is called an amoeba. I don't think that an amoeba evolved into uh, some type of swimming creature and that eventually evolved into some type of a mammalian whale creature, which then eventually walked onto the land and then eventually turned into a monkey and then eventually turned into a human. I just don't believe that. I don't, I, I've studied biology since 1977 this is when i first started reading encyclopedias and everything that i've studied and ever learned about the human body and i'm not an expert i'm not a phd and i'm like nothing like that just a researcher but everything that i've studied it shows me that uh micro evolution is very possible in other words small changes over time in other words I like it hot. I, I love 110, 120 degree heat all day long. I love it. I can I can live in it. Okay. I was at I was at home in, in, in Egypt and Africa. I was at home in in uh, Dubai. Right. I love humidity and I love heat. Now, when I go to cold places, I really suffer. However, I've been in cold places for an extended period of time. I spent one time a winter in a cold place. And when I first got there, of course, I was in complete agony. Over time, it got better. And I can only imagine if I stayed there for three or four years, eventually my body would adjust. That's a micro adjustment. Now, if I were to have kids that then were born there and then grew up there and then they had kids, by the time the third or fourth generation, they go outside in 40 degree weather with a t-shirt and shorts on, right? Which would kill me. So micro evolution, I believe, is possible. But an amoeba turning into a human being via the monkey, I just don't. I just don't see it. I just don't see it. I know that there was a doctor, before I continue on with this, there was a doctor, I'm uh, sorry, a scientist, a scientist in a lab. And uh, some years back, he took a flask, okay? He took a flask and he um, uh, he vacuumed it. He took all the, everything out of it and he sealed it. And he burned it too. So when he vac before he burned before he before yeah before he vacuumed it he he put heat in there high heat to to kill anything that could be potentially alive inside the flask and then he vacuumed it and sealed it so there's nothing in there it should be completely empty. He come he comes back you know a few days later to look at the flask and under an electron microscope he starts to see living things inside the flask. And what what he found was what I already had hypothesized was that. Life is emanating from the vesica pisces from the flower of life on a consistent basis, fully formed. I, I believe that all life is fully formed on its arrival, uh, you know, to some degree, and that the evolution is not exactly what we've been taught. This here is my team of, um, of Anunnaki history admins, and I want to thank every single one of them because sometimes I don't get a chance to thank them. So I'm showing their names on the screen here. They helped me with a lot of my research. They help me manage and run my groups on you on Facebook. I have huge groups on Facebook. One of them has 120,000. Another one has 100,000. Another one has 50,000. And so they help me run these groups and they help me uh, research material and they help me find answers and information. Uh, so I really appreciate them. So I just wanted to give them a quick shout out. I'm going to go over a little bit of the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation before we wrap this up tonight. And I'll come back on and continue, you know, with this more. This is really like a six-hour presentation, and we only have an hour. Um, but the Enuma Elish is an ancient tablet, okay, a series of tablets. And here go the seven tablets here. These tablets have writing on them called cuneiform. This is cuneiform writing. And if you've seen any of the tours of my house that I've done before, <clears throat> I have books here that teach you how to write in cuneiform and also read cuneiform, which I've been studying for quite some time. Now, there is a huge misinformation thing going on and has been going on on the internet for a long time 
that Zachariah Sitchin, who was a famous researcher and author of ancient tablets and, and the story of these ancient Anunnaki, that Zachariah Sitchin was the only person that can read these tablets. That was a fabrication made up, doesn't exist. Not only did he, is he not the only person that can that had a chance to read some of these tablets, but he but he didn't even use the translation. He didn't use his own translations in his work. He used translations that already existed. The guy was a great man, and they tried to, to muddy up his name at the end of his life by saying he was the only one. He made these stories up, and nobody can read these things. We don't even know what he's talking about. He could say anything he wants because nobody knows it. Oh, really? Well, let's analyze that for a minute. The Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation. The Enuma Elish is a Babylonian creation myth, and it was recovered by Austin Henry Laird in 1849 in the uh, ruined library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, which is Moscow, Iraq. It was published by George Smith in 1876. What year did I just say, guys? 1876. Now, Zachariah Sitchin just died about five years ago. <laughs> I don't think he was even in his daddy's uh, private parts back then. I'm just saying, okay? The Enuma Elish has about a thousand lines and is recorded in old Babylonian on seven clay tablets, each holding between 115 and 170 lines of sumo Akkadian cuneiform script. Most of the tablet five had never been recovered until recently, and tablet five was discovered at the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq. This epic is one of the most important sources for understanding the Babylonian worldview centered on the, su the supremacy of Marduk and the creation of humankind for the service of the gods. Its primary original purpose, however, is not an exposition of theology or theology, but the elevation of Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, above other Mesopotamian gods. Who is Marduk? Marduk appears in the Bible. Marduk appears in the Torah. Marduk appears in the, uh, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Who is he? He's Amun-Ra. <laughs> yeah, remember I kept telling you guys, you've been praying to the wrong people? When you say amen, you're saying amen to this guy. This guy was evil, man. He was evil. He was the one who said, there'll be no other God but me. He's a jealous God. That all made it into the biblical text. That came from Marduk's words. When you hear the word God during this lecture, keep in mind that I'm not referring to the creator of the universe, because I do believe that there's a creator of the universe. I'm referencing the Anunnaki beings that masqueraded, masqueraded as gods with a lowercase g, and were worshipped not only by the Sumerians, but by many civilizations that they themselves had kick-started. The Enuma Elish exists in various copies from Babylon and Assyria, and the version of the library of Ashurbanipal dates back to the 7th century BCE, and the composition of the text probably dates back to the Bronze Age, the time of Hammurabi, or perhaps the early Kassite era. And I have the code of Hammurabi right here in my office that I've read, it's an amazing piece of work. This is Tablet 5 at the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq. Now, let's look at George Smith, because this is where Zachariah Sitchin was able to acquire a lot of his story or his, uh, his deciphering of the actual uh, Sumerian tablets. You see, he didn't decipher them himself. He used existing, well-documented, and very well-done uh, you know, translations. So all that stuff you have been hearing floating around all these years about Zacharias Hitchin was the only one who could read these tablets and nobody knows what he's talking about. He can make anything up. That's a lie. Those are people who never even researched this information, don't know anything about the tablets and probably never even read one. I've been on I've been on um, on uh, panels, discussion panels with with people called experts that have been on big time TV shows that have never read one Sumerian tablet, but have an opinion about them and have an opinion about Zachariah Sitchin, and they never even researched the content or the information. So it's not just some of the people just, you know, in the conscious community. It's some people who, who, who you know, claim to be experts as well, but they've never read, never even picked up a tablet. But you can read a tablet. You can go to the UCLA, UCLA Cuneiform Library online, and you can actually read all the tablets for yourself. The translator will translate them for you. You don't need anybody else. You can do it yourself. My son read the Sumerian. My son, Justin, he read the Sumerian tablets on his own. 
George Smith, 1840 to 1876, was an English Assyriologist, apprentice engraver, but self-taught in cuneiform in the corridors of the British Museum. Eventually, he was hired by Sir Henry Rawlinson, a prominent archaeologist, and Smith achieved worldwide attention when he discovered an account of the flood with obvious biblical parallels in 1872. They were related to the Chaldean account of the deluge, again, another flood account. This book expands on the previous work and presents numerous translations of tablets, including the first print appearance of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a true full story of Noah's Ark and all of that, it all was done long before, obviously, this is, we're talking about coming out of ancient tablets. This stuff existed long before the Bible was even conceived to be written, right? The, the, the Bible was written between 100 AD to 900 AD, and these tablets are eight to 10,000 and beyond years old. We also have another person that was very well versed at translating these tablets long before Zacharias Hitchin was born and well documented, E.A. Spicer. In 1926, E.A. Spicer won a Guggenheim Fellowship to study the remains of the ancient Mitanni and Hurrians in northern Mesopotamia. While there in 1927, he discovered the Tepe Guara and one of the world's earliest cradles of civilization. In 1928, he was appointed the assistant professor of Semitics at the University of Pennsylvania and the full professor in 1931. He was a field director of the Joint Excavation of the American Schools of Oriental Research and the University Museum, 1930 to 32, 1936, 37, undertaking excavations in Tepe Guara and Tel Bila. He also translated the Hurrian legal text found at Nuzi. After the war, he returned to the University of Pennsylvania, where he was chairman of the Department of the Oriental Studies from 1947 until his death in 1965. He was also appointed Ellis Professor of Hebrew and Semitic Languages and Literatures in 1954. He translated and wrote extensive commentary for the volume of Genesis in the Anchor Bible series and, one of, and was one of the editors of the Torah in the New Jewish Publication Society of America version of the Old Testament. A noted student of his, future professor, Moshe Greenberg, became an Israel Prize laureate in the Bible studies. This guy had extremely high credentials, and yes, he translated also the Sumerian cuneiform tablets long before uh, and well done, Zachariah Sitchin. Okay, so I'm just I'm just I'm debunking this Zachariah Sitchin made the story up thing, and he didn't know what he and he was the only one who can read the tablets. It's a lie. Anybody who see posting that on social media, posting it on Instagram, I keep seeing it pop up from time to time. They they don't know anything. They haven't studied any any of this information. They know nothing. They know nothing. They're just fabricating information for views and likes. I'm gonna give you one more, Leonard William King. Okay. 1869 to August 1919. All right. Again, before Zachariah Sitchin, he was an English Assyria, uh, archaeologist and Assyriologist, educated at a rugby school in King's College in Cambridge. He collected stone and inscriptions widely in the Near East, taught Assyrian and Babylonian archaeology at King's College for a number of years, and published a large number of works on these subjects. He is known for his translations of the ancient works, such as the Code of Hammurabi. He became the assistant to the keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum. Some of his first works, Steps in Assyrian, a book for beginners, um, a series of historical and mythological, religious, magical, and epistolary, and other texts printed in cuneiform characters with interlinear transliteration and translation, and a sketch of Assyrian grammar, sign list, and vocabulary. This guy was an expert, man. An expert. So when these tablets, when we tell you we're reading these tablets, we're reading tablets that were deciphered by people that are well versed in these translations and these multi languages, these ancient languages, these ancient tongues. OK, it's real stuff. This is the real information coming from our ancestors. Letters and inscriptions of Hammurabi, he wrote in 1898. Encyclopedia Biblica. He was a contributor to that in 1903. Egypt and Western Asia in the light of recent discoveries, 1907. Chronicles Concerning Early Babylonian Kings, 1907. Legends of Babylonian and Egyptian in Relation to Hebrew Tradition, 1916. The Seven Tablets of Creation, which is what this I was kind of leading in here. Okay, He deciphered those and wrote about those, the Babylonian and Syrian legends concerning the creation of the world and mankind. The Code of Hammurabi in 1899. We're talking about experts here. Okay, And uh, in the Library of Ashurbanipal, here we see a fragment of uh, the cuneiform. So if you say, where are these things located? Can I actually go see them? 
yeah, you can go see these tablets, man. They're real. Just go to go to England, go to the British Museum, and they're right there. You can take a picture with your phone and go back, and you can decipher the cuneiform for yourself if you don't believe what it says. It's all real. Here is the CDLI cuneiform digital library hosted by UCLA in America. So if you want to know what stone tablets say, you can go to this uh, website, CDLI cuneiform digital library, Google that. Go to this website and you can grab a virtual stone off the virtual shelf and drop it into a translating device and it will give you a spit out what's a, what the words are saying in cuneiform to English or whatever other language you speak. OK, again, you don't need to you, you don't need to read Zacharias Hitchens work. You can read this for yourself and come up with your own conclusions. Was Zacharias Hitchens 100 percent accurate on everything that he came up with in his books? Maybe not. These are a lot of these are theories. He. He what he did was he left a, a reference to every single location that he got the text from to come up with his theory for that particular part of the book. He left a, a dog on breadcrumb trail. If he was off here, off there, it doesn't matter. His 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 things that might have been slightly off were small compared to the general picture. The general picture is, and and now hundreds of researchers and 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 uh, uh, and, and archaeologists have come up with the same conclusion, including myself. People from somewhere else came here, according to these texts, engaged mankind, and uh, not only taught us things, but also at some point genetically modified us, turning us into worker bees for them and making us believe that they were God, but they weren't. They were just regular old fashioned people, just like me and you. They just had a little bit more knowledge. That's all they had. They put on their pants one leg at a time, just like us. And so this is how cuneiform is made. Um, I wonder if I could play this on. Let me see if I can get this to play for a second here. Related to the modern languages of Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic. The writing system which Cyrus's officials used was the traditional cuneiform script, which had been invented in ancient Europe, which is a Semitic tongue related to the modern languages start over. of Hebrew That's weird. and Arabic and Aramaic. Writing system which Cyrus's officials used was the traditional cuneiform script, which had been invented in ancient Iraq well before 3000 BC. It is written by pressing a stylus, something a bit like a chopstick, into the surface of the clay, which is nearly dry, and the signs which convey the sound of the language consist of different arrangements of these strokes. They're written one by one, and the reader has to join them up, and the sound emerges from the clay. This is the line that says, I am Kurash, Shah of Kishati, king of the world, the great king, king of Babylon, and so it goes on. So we're going to write Kurash. So the first sign, Ku, has a big vertical, two small horizontals, one bigger horizontal, a little vertical, and another horizontal, like a box. This is Ku. Then Ra, we have three strong horizontals to begin, one big one next to it, and then one little vertical wedge, and one bigger vertical wedge. Ku, Ra. Now we do Ash, which is three long horizontals, Konsa, and then a vertical in the middle. So we can read this, Ku, Ra, Ash. The name of Cyrus. Okay. It's a type. Real simple, guys. Just showing you that there's no mystery behind these tablets. Like, there's been this big thing, like, nobody can read the tablets. That's actually not true. I mean, there's a lot of people that can read these tablets. And I got books in here on how to read the tablets. So that's what's stopping a lot of people from digging into this wisdom and this knowledge because they think they think that it's so far out there and it's so ambiguous and nobody knows what these things really say when that's actually not true we know exactly what they say and it's not a mystery we like we really really know so i've just spent a lot of time trying to debunk the debunking of the tablets and getting you to understand that zach ryan sitchin wasn't really wrong he was a great researcher he used existing translations he didn't translate anything himself and more people than none know what these tablets say all around the world. It's not a mystery anymore. Okay. And so we have, you see here the Torah, which is the, the law of God, which is what that actually means. 
a lot of the stories that came from these ancient tablets made their way into the Torah. Okay. Um, they literally copied uh, very poorly as well a lot of the information from tablets and they kind of chopped it up and put it in ways the Council of Nicaea. They put it in ways where, you know, they can coordinate it to where they can utilize it for their own purpose. There's a lot of wisdom and knowledge in there, but at the same time, a lot of it is kind of cu it's curated information. Uh, of course, what they did in the Torah was they took out the word gods with an S and they replaced gods with God singular because they wanted to only have just one God when in true reality, there's more than one God. God even said that there's more than one God in the Bible. Okay. And here you go with the ancient Jewish history. You can go to the ancient Jewish history books. You can get them out or you can go online to the Jewish virtual library dot org. Okay, and you can say, well, people say, well, well, these people's names aren't in the in the Bible and 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 the, the, the Torah. Oh yeah, they are. I mean, here go look, Marduk. I just did one, and I can do them for so many different names. Just highlight Marduk, 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 Enki, Enki, Enki. Enki's in here also. If you, if you look between where some of the highlights are off to the right, you'll see Enki's name. Enki and Marduk are in the Jewish Torah. These people were real people. These weren't fabricated names and fabricated people they really existed and lil's name is in here too they're all in here anu in the bible they're called the anak okay so this is the two trillion hubble skybook and hubble telescope looked at this one dot in the sky and when it zoomed into the one tiny dot it found trillions two trillion galaxies two trillion galaxies in an area the size of the tip of a pen. And what does that tell you guys? <laughs> the tip of the iceberg, man. You know, at some point we have to drop this egotistical mindset thinking that this earth and us being people on this earth are the center of the universe. Because I guarantee you, we're probably one of the, one of the newer rising civilizations in the universe and that there's a lot of other civilizations that could be millions of years old. Millions. And I, I estimate that the Anunnaki were at least one million years ahead of us technologically, based off of, off, the, off the descriptions of the technology that they used when they arrived and some of the artifacts that have been left behind. And, of course, the giant temples and structures. I'm estimating a million years. They had a good understanding of how to combine spirituality or spiritual energy with technology, and they merged the two together. They also incorporated technology into their bodies. Uh, so they had that capability as well, which gave them these godlike uh, uh, functions or features. Um, but in true reality, they were just people with advanced technology. Um, and so what I'm going to do is next week, I'm going to go into our solar system and I'm going to dig deep into rogue planets. I'm going to dig deep into how the Earth came to be and a new theory that you probably never heard about with regards to um, why we find artifacts. When we dig deep into these uh, mines, we find artifacts based on the depth and the levels of the layers of rock that are estimated to be between 300 and 400 million years old. How in the world can there be an artifact down there? How in the world can there be a pottery down there? How in the world can there be a hammer down there? How did that get there? Where did it come from? Well, I'm going to tell you where it came from next week. And it didn't come from us, and it didn't come from Earth. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting talk uh, on the next live that I do. Okay, very interesting. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. I'll answer a few questions, and then i got to pop out of here. Uh, let me get back to the screen, to the camera. Here we go. We're back. We're back. Okay. Um, somebody says, so exactly what does God... There we go. Christina Marie. So exactly what does God or slash gods mean? Okay, good question, Christina. So if you look into the ancient Sumerian tablets and some of the other ancient Indian epics as well, these people like to call themselves gods. Okay. In other words, are they calling themselves, they're saying that they're higher level than an average person on the planet in terms of their capability, that they have this uh, ability to, to live forever. They were immortals. They considered themselves immortals. Um, you know, the Anunnaki uh, called themselves the savants. They call themselves, you know, the heroes of old. They had all these name, great names for themselves. But when you find out that they were battling each other severely, like 
harshly battling each other, using humans to do the war, just like we do now, right? Um, but they had humans worshiping them. So in the Bible, like let's say you're looking at the book of Deuteronomy, for example, you'll see a section in Deuteronomy where God tells the people that there's some people way out there on another side of this doggone continent. They've been doing some stuff I don't like, even though you don't know anything about these people. He says, you know what? I want y'all to go over there and I want you to kill every single one of them. We got to rid the planet of this evil. So these zealot, these religious zealots that are following this Anunnaki God who think he's really a creator of the universe, which, by the way, I'm glad I said he. Because the Anunnaki that ruled here were male figures and masqueraded as gods, the fact of, the, of us worshiping them has bled all the way into this current era where we're still calling God he, when God is not a he. The creator of the universe is a frequency, not a he or a she. The energy is feminine and masculine energy, a certain specific combination of the two, along with cymatic frequencies, not a man or a woman. And still to this very day, we're saying he, 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 right? But that's where it comes from, these Sumerian gods that were ruling. They send you halfway around the world to go kill some people. And the exact words in the Bible are rape the women, kill the children, kill the, the pets and animals and take the spoils of war and bring them back to me. And so these people would go out there and they would they would go behind the walls of these cities and they would kill these people. And then here he goes again. Hey, there's some people over here. I want to I want to get these people. They don't they don't they don't think I'm the real god, the one and only god. I want you to go over there and kill these people. And as a matter of fact, if you see some women that you like <clears throat> that they're virgins, you can take them as your wife. So now we have <laughs> we we <laughs> we have breaking and entering we have murder, we have abduction, we have rape. I mean, this is crazy. This is in the Bible. So this really is God's plural. Even though it said God said this, it's really God's. It's really the Anunnaki's battling each other, multiple people living in different capitals around the planet, fighting each other using human beings as chattel. It's the same thing they do today. Nothing's changed. They will tell you, go around half the you go and sign up for their military and they'll send you halfway around the world give you a $5 million weapon to kill a guy riding a camel that lives in a $5 tent. It's the same exact thing. Nothing's, nothing's changed. It's the same exact scenario. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see what we got here. You're welcome, moon goddess. Thank you. Uh, let me see what this is. I'm trying to click it. There we go. Okay. I appreciate all the great comments, guys. Nuclear weapons. Yes, there were nuclear weapons in ancient times. So we have evidence of nuclear weapons being used in those wars that, that uh, were on Earth. There's an account in the Sumerian tablets where the breakaway civilization that was started on Earth, they had these weapons of mass destruction, which is what it roughly translates into from the tablets. They hid them in a mountain. Uh, they meaning Enlil and Enki, they hid these weapons. They should have never brought them here. They were forbidden to be used on their planet ever again. So obviously, at some point in the past, they were talking about the fact that these weapons had been used on their planet. And when they started their new civilization on this other planet named Nibiru, they were forbidden to ever be used. But they snuck some of those things to Earth. Then a power struggle ensues with Amun-Ra, Marduk, right? And, and, uh, and, and the other Sumerians, uh, other, other Anunnaki's. And he wanted to take kingship over Earth faster than he was supposed to based off the procession. Everybody ruled during a procession of the equinox, during a specific alignment. He wanted to take over Pisces early. And it was a big war. He started this huge war over this thing. And people went and got the, ma the weapons of mass destruction. And Enki was like, don't use these things. And they used them anyway. And the evidence of this is in the Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley. You can see that the buildings turned to glass. People dead in the street right now today. Google Mohen Jindaro, Indus Valley, dead bodies. They're still laying there holding hands today. No animals have scavenged on the bodies. The bodies have higher level than background radiation when you take a Geiger counter out there. And that huge swath of desert in Africa is not exactly supposed to be like that. It's evidence of a major uh, explosion and heat flash, more than 3,000 degrees temperature. If you're at Giza and you put your hand deep in the sand, 
eventually you're going to bring up balls of glass. How does sand turn to glass? You need 3,000 plus degree temperature and a very, 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 very powerful explosion. So it's evidence of an ancient war that occurred in ancient Egypt and Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley and several other places on Earth have now traces. They found traces of xenon, which is a, not only just regular xenon, but weapons grade xenon. Now, what's interesting about this is this weapons grade xenon is a side effect of nuclear explosions. And if you look at the REMS unit data from Mars, which analyzes the Mars atmosphere and also the other science that we've collected over the last two decades from the soil, they have found an abundance of xenon in the Mars atmosphere and in the Mars soil. And look what Mars looked like. It looks like a giant desert. Do you think you know what happened there? Yeah, a war. Millions of years ago, there was a catastrophe that that uh, where, where Tiamat blew up, but it healed and became very habitable again. And how do we know this? The Enuma Elish. It talks about the Anunnaki named Ijiji living on Mars. And it talks about them wanting to go to war against Enki and Enlil, okay, over the battle over how much work needed to be done. Much later, this war over kingship and control of the planet and the people extended from Earth to the moon and then all the way to Mars, this Atlantean war. And those weapons of mass destruction were used extensively on Mars. And that's why there's weapons grade xenon from nuclear explosions in the atmosphere and in the soil. Okay. Real science data. All right. Smile a while says, what type of instrument was the Ankh? That's a great question. So the Ankh was a multifunctional device. In modern times, it's nice jewelry. <laughs> it makes earrings and jewelry, right? Necklaces and earrings. But in true fact, the Ankh had a much deeper meaning. Not only is it representing the womb and life, the key of life, but the Ankh also had a technological purpose. And so if you look at the Jed Pillar Ankh in particular that the kings used to have, it had a Jed inside of the Ankh shape. The Jed was a condenser, and it actually used to vibrate at specific frequencies, and it literally would align itself to the atomic frequency of the owner of the Ankh. And so each Ankh for the special gods, not for everyone, only for the elite of the elite, they had special Ankhs that were attuned to their uh, atomic frequency. It was like a key. And only they in, can walk through the gates. The stargates that existed, and they're well documented that they existed in ancient texts. Even in Sumerian tablets, they have Enlil walking through stargates called the Duran Key. Nobody, let's say I wanted to walk through that stargate. And let's say I stole Enlil's Ankh. Guess what happened, guys? It's not going to work for me. It's attuned to the subatomic frequency of the vibrating atoms in Enlil's body. Won't work for me. Only the person that has the, the key, the, the frequency of your body is programmed into the Jed Pillar Ankh. And then that frequency then is encoded into the uh, mechanism that allowed the gate to work. So in order to walk through the gate, it had to match that key, and you, your body had to also resonate at the same frequency, or you couldn't walk through. And that was amazing technology for back then. All right. Let's see what else we got here. I'm going to answer a couple more, then I got to run. Great question here. B. Marshall, is the moon artificial? That is a great, great question. Yes, it is, and yes, it isn't. It's a double answer there, and the reason there's a reason why. First and foremost, we find that the moon... Uh, it appears to have, because of orbital mechanics, okay, orbital mechanics, we can take the moon and we can reverse it in time. We can move it and move it and move it and move it and move it. And all of a sudden, we find out that the moon used to be somewhere else in, in our solar system. The same thing with Mars. You can reverse Mars's orbit over millions of years through a computer simulation. You find out that, wait a minute, this thing didn't use to orbit the sun like this. What happened here? The moon, our moon, and Mars used to orbit another planet named Tiamat, okay? Now, what's interesting is when it gravitation got locked with Earth and moved here, these beings, named the Anunnaki, we could, it could be Atlanteans or whatever you want to call them, some great advanced ancient civilization decided to turn it into a base. And what they did was they tidal locked the moon with the Earth's rotation so that only one side of the moon shows to the Earth at any given time. And they put a great 
technological base on the backside of the moon. And what's the evidence of this, you say? Download the Clementine mission data. It's freedom of information, guys. Clementine mission image data. Okay? Download that. I downloaded it years ago. Guess what I found? A couple things first. The military sent a private mission, a top secret mission to the moon using a satellite named Clementine. Now, right away when I saw the name Clementine, I knew something happened already to the, to the mission. I knew that this object was never going to come back because there's a song called Clementine. Oh, my darling Clementine. It's a country song. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm an older guy, so I probably know it maybe because I've seen some of the Little House on the Prairie shows and stuff. But it goes, oh, my darling Clementine, you were lost and gone forever. Oh, my darling Clementine. So when I saw the name Clementine, I'm like, why would they name this thing Clementine? I said, oh, my God, it's never going to come back. And the deeper I got into the research of this document, the more I found that this object had transmitted information and then never came back. According to the military, it stopped working and crash landed on the dark side of the moon. Well, when you look at the mission data, it looked like it hit something on the dark side of the moon and then it went down. It didn't just crash. But I think they knew that something was there and they wanted it to run into it. They wanted to, to impact whatever they thought it was. That's my, my opinion because we've done dumb stuff like that before. But the image data came back in high res and it's available to the general public and it shows a lot of anomalies. So what I'll probably do next week is probably I'll show anomalies from the moon and anomalies on Mars. And I'll take you to Mars live as well. We'll go on a live trip to Mars through worldwide, uh, worldwidetelescope.org and we'll take a little trip there and we'll look around on the surface and take and have a look through the eyes of the rover and see what we can find. But um, which is going to be amazing, by the way. So this, this thing sent back images. And so what we found was that there's structures up there, massive, massive structures. And I found one of the largest structures ever documented on the moon that made mainstream news. Even they couldn't figure out what the hell, what it was I saw. And I used images that were pre, that predated CGI and predated uh, Photoshop because I got the original uh, f uh, video footage directly from the source. And then all I did was screenshot it, took away the contrast and zoomed in. And I found a gigantic dome there, a dome structure. So it's going to be interesting to check that out. But the moon itself, to answer your question, appears to now have been hollowed out and has structures built on the inside. And how do we come up with this conclusion? Okay. There is ground penetrating radar data at usgs.gov that anybody can get it. It's free to the general public. Free. You could download the ground penetrating radar data of the moon. It was done by the Arecibo uh, observatory, which now is damaged in Puerto Rico. It recently got damaged like last year. Thankfully, we got this data out of this thing long before that happened. Now, when you look at the footage, when you look at the imagery right away, without even having to stress your eyes, you can see that the moon is multi-layered and you can see things that look like gigantic beams underneath the surface. Another thing that you see is these craters that are on the moon. They all have the same depth. <laughs> they all seem to have the same exact depth. And nothing has seemed to have hit it in angles that create skid marks. And a lot of these craters don't have any ejecta. So when you impact something, you get this ejecta. And then the ejecta, because of the gravity of the moon itself, even though it's not a lot, but it's still there, it falls back down around the rim. There's not a lot of ejecta on the moon which is leading a lot of people to believe, researchers at least, that some of these craters are maybe artificial craters. There's an amazing audio that's in a documentary that, I, that I'm in called What If? And that What If documentary is on Forbidden Knowledge TV. You can watch it, okay? And we have the audio file of, um, of the Apollo mission where they're flying over one of these craters looking for a landing spot in the Sea of Tranquility. And you hear the astronaut say, I bet the people down there never get out. Now, why wouldn't he say that? And we have the redacted documents, which also they didn't redact the actual statement from Neil saying that the people down there, he best said that they, ne they never get out talking about the people that live in these craters. So when you look at this multi, this, 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 um, this ground penetrating radar, you can see the multi layers underneath the, the moon. And now it, it's no wonder why when they said when they when they crashed something into it, 
you know, years ago, it rang like a bell for hours because it looks, it seems to be hollowed out and there's some structures on the inside of this thing. There's a lot going on up there that we just don't know. When one of the missions went and orbited the moon, didn't try to land, just did an orbit and come back, part of the whole process of eventually trying to figure out how to get to the moon. When they got to the dark side of the moon, which is really not dark, it's just we call it dark because we can't see it, you lose radio, you're out of radio frequency, you can't transmission, you can't talk to Earth, you can't talk to command center anymore because the moon is blocking the transmission, are you in the dark? Now, something took over the astronauts' comms. All of their comms were hacked into on the backside of the moon. This is well-documented and publicly available information as well. And they started hearing some weird music on the backside of the moon, which is coming from the moon's surface. It almost sounded like a chorus singing, some, the best that they can describe it. But it hacked into their comms, okay? And they were all panicking because this is, shouldn't be happening. So their comms got hacked. So there's something going on up there. And then you have all these sightings that have happened around the moon, you know, for so many decades. So it's really interesting and well-documented situation where things are, you know, transiting the moon, lights moving around and all this kind of crazy stuff. It's really, it's really incredible. And I'll show you some of my anomalies from the moon next time we come on and it'll blow your mind. You're going to say to yourself, what is this doing here? And this is not from any manned moon mission. These are from... Uh, satellites and the beautiful thing about Freedom of Information Act, you get you get access to this stuff, and there's nothing they can do about it because they did it with government money, they did it with the people's money. So this is why the new push for space is into private now, because they don't want to answer any more questions, they don't want to have to give up any more documents. So now they've hired private corporations to do a lot of the research so that the documents can stay hidden and out of the view of the public eye. Okay. Um, let's see what we got here. Good question here by Lowe. Where are the female giants? That is a great, 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 great question. A lot of the times we only talk about the fact that there were male giants. And a lot of the times we bring up male giants and, and they discover bones of male giants. But there were also female giants as well. Uh, Inanna. Nishhurton and Hershag, uh, these people were big people. Uh, and they have discovered uh, some of the female bones that show that, you know, females, some of the females were giants as well. But because of a male dominant, um, you know, society, uh, male energy dominance that we have on this planet, it's always primarily focusing on men. You see the same thing with the NBA and the WNBA. The NBA, you know, when every game comes on, you know what channel it's going to be on. You know when the playoffs start and end, you know who won. With the WNBA, you're trying to, you, you got to scratch. If, you, if you're into that sport, you got to scratch your head and figure out when the heck this stuff is coming on, what channel it's on this year. It moves around from year to year. You don't know when it's going to, who's playing, when they're playing. And, uh, and a lot of the times, these WNBA players are, are far superior than their male counterparts. Not because of athleticism, because they're not going to fly out of the gym and dunk on everybody, but because of their brain. They can outplay the men in a lot of cases because they play cerebral basketball. They don't play physical basketball. And so if you're a true basketball fan of the actual sport itself, you'd love to watch a WNBA or a, a women's basketball game. I coached women's basketball for a long time. That's why I know this. But they don't get the props. So when they do find the women's bones and things like that and the big skulls, they, they don't focus on saying anything about women. It's just a natural natural thing that men have done over eons, suppressing the female energy, unfortunately. But they are out there. They do exist. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to ask one more, then I got to run, guys. Let's see. Can't find anything. A lot of great comments. So I appreciate all the great comments and stuff like that. Oh, man, this is a good one here. Eric Lee. So who is the devil and do they speak about him in the tablets? Hey, hey that's a great question. <clears throat> Wrapping up on a great question tonight. So the devil is Satan, the Lord of Eden. Okay, the Lord of Eden, E-D-I-N. And in the tablets, Eden was a outdoor laboratory where they would mate 
these hominids together, trying to get the procreation going to build a workforce. And Satan is actually known as Enlil, E-N-L-I-L, Enki's brother, who really had a distaste for people and humans in particular. He was a bad dude. He would actually, if, if the people were, he said if the people were clamoring too much, he would just have them killed off. He'd be like, just kill them. Kill as many as you can. He'd order them to be killed. If the, if the, if the people were clamoring too much in the field, and he got tired of hearing the people and chatter because of their, you know, the, the, the breeding program was a success. He'd go, you know what? Dry out their fields and spray the fields. And they were actually doing chemtrails back in ancient times in these tablets. He'd mess up their crops and everything and have them starve to death. Uh, he'd put plagues on them in the tablets. He put plagues on people. Uh, he was an evil dude. Even during the time where they were going to be, they knew the deluge was coming. They knew this object was going to. Uh, either crash into earth and create this global flood or this part, gro part global flood or regional flood. And according to these tabs, they had the capability to stop this from happening. And he said, no, he was the commander. So he had the, he had the last say. He said, no, wipe them clean and we're going to start over again. I don't want to see these people. I want to wipe it. I want to start fresh. And so this guy was pretty evil. Okay. This guy and Lil, his, his other name in modern times in the Bible is named Yahweh. <laughs> this is Yahweh that people pray to. This is people you're praying to, the devil. You're praying to this evil guy. This guy's an evil entity. He could care less about a human being. I could care less. He would, to him, according to him, what he said, we were just animals to him. <clears throat> animals. That's what he saw us as animals. And he can care if we lived or, or if we died. So that is the answer to your question. And Lil, <clears throat> in the Garden of Eden, he, his brother Enki came and taught the humans the true knowledge of who they are gave them knowledge of self the apple was knowledge it had nothing to do with eating an apple and all this other kind of crazy stuff it's that's a metaphor it was knowledge and so when and, and when enki woke them up to the fact of who they are and that they were just as good as and just the same or maybe even as powerful as them that's when they sparked he sparked them and they woke up and then when the evil one and lil came back he cursed them and everything else and kicked them out of the garden and blah, 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 blah. You know the story. Uh, but then and Lil got so enraged by what his brother did, he started telling people that his brother was the evil devil when in fact he was the evil devil. He was the evil one and his brother wasn't. His brother was a knowledge seeker <clears throat> and actually loved humans and even married a human. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it was opposite. But his brother started trying to spread the word that his that that Enki was evil, but really Enlil, also known as Yahweh, was the evil one, which later on became known as the devil. All right. Um, so anyway, guys, it's been a great night. I've been going for about an hour and a half. Okay, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for uh spending the time with me tonight. I'm gonna take this audio and put it up on my podcast network, and I'll be back again next week with some great information. And by the way, don't forget. We have the Forbidden Knowledge Tour of Egypt. I'm going to drop the link in the chat right quick for everybody in case you're interested in it. Uh, it's going to be an amazing tour. I can't wait to take everyone out to this tour. It only I only have room for 40 people. Uh, let me grab the link to it right now. Okay. <clears throat> and drop it here in the chat to you. Okay, here's the link. I'm just dropping it in the chat on youtube the forbidden tour of egypt 40 people max we've already got people that have bought tickets so the tickets are running out the reason why i say 40 instead of 50 is because the, there's 10 people that have to be in my crew camera crew armed guards you know uh, egyptologists guides and all of that and so uh, really 40 people max <clears throat> all right so looking forward to that uh, a lot of great announcements coming out at the beginning of january the forbidden coin is going to drop. I'm going to do an airdrop and give away free coins. I'll be accepting the coin on my website as payment. And I'm building a, a, a forbidden college where the coin will be accepted. And also a business directory where people can accept the, the coin as well. Uh, and of course, also, you can just buy the coin and hold it, you know, like you buy Bitcoin or anything else and try to see where it goes to in terms of buying and selling or trading or whatever you want to do with it. Also, uh, my first NFT drops next year. The NFT is coming out. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. It's gonna be dope, though. You're gonna love this NFT. 
Uh, and of course, we have the new season, new shows coming out on Forbidden Knowledge. We've got several major new shows with great hosts, great talent, great hosts that are all being recorded in the beginning of the year, which all will be out by spring. So we're launching the whole second quarter with a whole brand new um, uh, list of shows that are all going to be great, high quality, 4K, professionally filmed with real producers, real directors and everything else. That's going to be great. So I'm looking forward to that as well. All right. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget the Forbidden Tour of Egypt and uh, go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com. You can also become an investor and own shares of Forbidden Knowledge. Click on invest and you can get your shares for one dollar a share. There's, I think there's um, 30,000 shares left or 20,000 shares left or something like that. So there, it's pretty much at the end now. We're getting ready to start round two in a few days. All right. Okay, guys. Catch y'all later. Peace.